Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. After many weeks of demonstrations everywhere in Hong Kong, it seems that the effective seizure of Hong Kong Airport, one of the world's busiest, has proved to be the final straw for China, and most expect a distinct hardening of the line that China will take towards the mass disruption and economic loss caused by the demonstrators. The British government, which seized the territory 150 years ago to punish China for stopping the British opium trade, has called for calm. The American government has, however, been turning up the heat. A suspiciously large number of US flags have appeared in the hands of the demonstrators, and the Stars and Stripes appears to be their anthem. Joining us to discuss what's going on in Hong Kong and what might happen next is one of Britain's leading communists, a long-standing friend of China, Dr. Ranjit Bra. Doctor, welcome to the show. Let's start with uh, what the demands of these protesters actually are, because it's obviously quite difficult to negotiate a change in Hong Kong's entire status within the country. Are there any of the protesters' demands that China could accept? George, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be with you both, George and Gayatri. Um, and I think it's a very interesting question. Um, so the protesters do have some demands, which are long-standing. They have a particular cultural identity. You know, they will speak Cantonese, for example, rather than the mainland Potonghua, the common tongue, or Mandarin. Um, and increasingly, since there's been the union, once again, of Hong Kong with China, um, there's been a large number of people who come and speak in the mainland language. And so there are some elements of their own regional and national identity, which they're very proud of and wish to present, wish to preserve. That's not unique to the people of Hong Kong. There are 18 million people who speak that language group, and the vast majority of them are within Guangzhou, within the wider area surrounding Hong Kong and part of China. So that in itself is not really a demand which would lead to major protests. There are elements around housing, which is very expensive. There are elements around schooling, which is in short supply. There are elements around medical care, normal social demands, what interestingly Mao would have characterized as contradictions among the people, things which can be raised as legitimate grievances and are in every society and can also be sorted out within the context and framework of that society. What's very clear to me is when you look at it, it bears all the hallmarks, not of just a domestic dispute, and our mainstream media are very keen to present it just as a purely domestic affair, but it's far more intermingled with the longer-term history of Hong Kong. And the history of Hong Kong, I have to say, is one which mirrors the history of British imperialism. It's the history which mirrors intervention of Britain within India, within China, and the very founding of those huge financial institutions that make Hong Kong such a major global city. The, uh flags has become quite a totemic uh, issue. When the protesters broke into the, uh, the assembly building, the local parliament, they hoisted the British colonial flag. Uh, that's been kind of superseded. Perhaps the Americans didn't like that quite so much <laughs> because out of nowhere, there seemed to have been a very large number of American flags appearing. This seems to suggest what China called uh, the black hand of American interference in the territories. Is that how you see it? I think that's a, a very succinct and apt summary, George. It has all the hallmarks of what we've come to be so familiar with as really a, the beginnings of a color revolution. If you look at the beginning of the dispute in Syria, it's straying from the point, but I think it, it, it bears some comparison. So in 2011, there seemed to be genuine social discontent around certain issues. and large demonstrations and the government trying to address that. And within that, there was a radical group who were not, consent, uh, not content. No concession that can be granted by the government would satisfy them. Rather, they used every grievance and every dispute as grounds for furthering the dispute, of widening the anger, of deepening the protest and escalating. There's a theory circulating amongst the demonstrators within Hong Kong uh, where they talk about um, a, a marginal violence. So 
what they want a core group of protesters to do is to be very provocative. And they have actually engaged in acid attacks upon the police, in taking their weapons and beating them, in surrounding and very, coming very close to lynching policemen. In order, none of that is shown in our social media, but you can see it if you look for it on YouTube. It's very clearly happened. And then in response and in acts of self-defense, one doesn't associate an act of self-defense with the state. There's an automatic assumption that if a policeman pulls a weapon, he's the aggressor. And that comes from our own experience in the United States, in Britain, in most countries, where workers are very much oppressed by the state. That's actually not the case in Hong Kong and China. But what is very clear is they provoke the police into acts of self-defense and then picture, yeah. you know, very widely, as, as they did in Venezuela, alleged acts of state repression. And so they're trying to build up, a, which is not a new thing, mm -hmm. a very clear propagandistic image as a heavy repressive state crushing democracy. And that's a point that I think we can come back to because there's a genuine misconception propagated by our own media that Hong Kong has a long history of democracy prior to its being granted or rather reunified with China. And that's that, absolutely that, that's not the case. That's a very good point because everything that is in the mainstream media is ahistorical. Gayatri's point there that we actually only ever had Hong Kong in our possession uh, to punish China for refusing to allow us to sell drugs in their country. Which that's is never, amazing of course, if you presented. think about it. Yeah, it's so it, ridiculous. Well, even in the history ridiculous. of uh, imperialism, exactly. that's quite it's, a, it's... a sordid affair. Uh, but there was no democracy Absolutely. in Hong Kong throughout Absolutely. that 150 years. Absolutely. And I think there are a couple of points that I'll briefly make that illustrate that very starkly. One is, you'll, you'll be familiar probably, George, with the rubber bullet, which was so notoriously used in the north of Ireland, one of Britain's, well, Britain's oldest colony, to repress particularly the Republican community. But a rubber bullet is a dangerous thing. It's fired with a high explosive round, and there's been many deaths associated with it. But the rubber bullet we associate with that conflict of the, in the north of Ireland that I grew up with in the 70s, 80s, perhaps into the early 90s, the rubber bullet was invented and first deployed in Hong Kong against rioting Chinese. The Chinese lived as really as colonial slaves. They were literally cage cities where the workers would live. They were so poor and housing was so expensive. They would sleep within a cage, so open air, cages one on top of each another in entire areas oh. of the city. So this is the economic poverty, the relative economic enslavement of the local population who had not a word to say about the appointment of the so governor and the ruling power. We fired rubber bullets first. Absolutely. In Hong Kong when we ruled it. That is true. That is an absolute fact, and, well, and, and you know, you can't every day is a school day. Uh, now, what's going to happen next? Um, I happen to think, I think the record shows it, that actually the Chinese authorities have been quite patient with these demonstrators. If Heathrow was occupied by thousands of demonstrators uh, for days and even weeks, we bringing all flights to a halt, I can promise you Heathrow would be cleared of those demonstrators. And I think that's true everywhere in the world, but that is only now beginning to happen uh, in Hong Kong. At the same time, people's fear is that China will crack down on this with a heavy hand mm. and really serious widespread violence and casualties will be the result. Do you think there's a danger of that? There are dangers both ways, and that's the beauty of these destabilization scenarios. If you don't do anything to check an act of mass destabilization, which ultimately doesn't have defined goals because its goal is to get as much as it can. So if they can push and push and push, they wanted in Tiananmen Square a, a, a kind of a Yeltsin moment. They wanted to have a full counter revolution and turn over this huge area of China with all its national resources you know, it's a huge prize. You know, India was the jewel in the crown of British imperialism. But modern business looks to China as a source of investment, as a source of, you know, cheap labor, as a place to make profit. And if they can not only just get, gain marketization, but full control economically and politically, there's huge amount of money to be made. So <clears throat> that's their ultimate aim. They didn't get that. And now they're looking more towards a kind of Maidan moment, I think, you know, a, a, a campaign of destabilization and to see what they can get. Of course, you know, people argue about what China is. You know, it's a very common topic of debate. Is it socialist? Is it communist? Is it fat capitalist? 
Economically, there are huge elements of capitalism within China. There are more billionaires in China than any other country apart from the United States, and that's a apparent contradiction. And that means that within Chinese society, there are some elements who would be open to that kind of movement. But I can tell you that the vast masses of Chinese people you know, are thankful for the revolution that liberated them from 150 years of colonial humiliation and took hundreds of millions, the four, five hundred million people lifted out of poverty. It's widely put about communism equals mass carnage, devastation, yeah. destruction and death is the kind of dogma that we're asked to accept and was repeated so often that we kind of do accept it very often unfailingly. If you actually look behind those statistics, you know, when Mao came to power, when he famously stood, and we're coming up to the 70th anniversary on the 1st of October this year of the revolution, when actually the Chinese finally achieved liberation and kicked colonial elements out and kicked the comprador elements who actually represented the United States and the Chiang Kai-shek government and still occupy Taiwan, of course. And they said Chinese people have stood up. The Chinese people at that point had a life expectancy of 35 years, average life expectancy. You know, when yet we're told millions died under Mao, and we can talk about the ins and outs perhaps on another occasion of and the vicissitudes of a long revolutionary struggle for liberation. But you know, when Mao died, the average life expectancy of the Chinese people had doubled or 70 people, for 70 years, and the population of China had doubled. And that is really a statistic which speaks volumes about what the Chinese people won from their revolution. And overall, they're extremely keen to protect it, and certainly to protect their independence and national sovereignty. And that's really what's at stake at, at the heart of this issue. Dr. Ranji, thanks for joining us on the Sputnik.